Good morning, beautiful family. I'm so excited to be able to share with you today. Are you happy? I can't see any smiles, so I have to just <laughs> assume that you're happy this morning. Well, I just want to say a very, very big thank you to Apostle C and Dr. Bev for this opportunity. It is always such a joy for me to be able to share with you. And can we just bow our heads for a moment as we go before the Lord in prayer? Oh, precious, precious Jesus, we want to thank you for your beautiful anointing amongst us right now. Thank you, Lord, that you are so faithful. Holy Spirit, I give myself completely to you today because you are the teacher. And I thank you that as I submit myself to you, you will take the Word of God and just let it fall like rain over us this morning. Soft spring rains, bringing new growth in our lives in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. <laughs> well, family, we are in our month of generosity, and I'm so excited about this mes message that I have today because I am going to be speaking about a title which I have called Begotten, Not Created. And that is obviously we're speaking about the greatest, greatest gift that mankind have ever received, and that is our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Eleven more sleepies, and it's Christmas. Anybody happy about that? <laughs> because Christmas time is without a doubt my most favorite time of the whole year. Wouldn't you agree with that? I'm just overwhelmed by, you know, just this, this generosity that God gave us, Jesus. And Christmas time really, without any doubt, just creates an atmosphere like no other. You know, even in the lives of unbelievers, that so many have said that during their festivities, they've kind of come to this awakening that Jesus really is the reason for the season. And it's brought about this longing within them to want to know God, an awakening that there's just something missing deep on the inside, longing to be fulfilled. It really is in this very act of gratitude to God that we become generous. And may I say, family, that before we go and buy all of our presents and all of our Christmas food and go on holiday, let's remember that we need to put God first. Amen? We need to give to God what is right, not what is left. Amen. So we need to come into, also not forget, to come into the house of the Lord to celebrate Jesus on Christmas Day. We're going to have an awesome day, time that day. So it really is my heart's cry this Christmas season that each and every one of you be blessed. And not just on the day, not just have a great meal and great family time and great presents, but really to receive those deep abiding blessings of Christmas. And to do that, one thing is essential, and that is that we keep Christ the center of all of our Christmas celebrations. You see, without Christ, Christmas loses its real and permanent value. And sadly for many, even Christians, Christmas has become all about that materialism and, and, and commercialism and self-indulgence. And to ensure that we do not get caught up in that we really need to, to intentionally keep our hearts and minds focused on God. And so it really is my prayer that this message today is going to inspire you to do that because we're going to be speaking about the many titles of Jesus. We know in the Bible, names and titles really always carry great significance. Every biblical name has a specific meaning, and it, especially when this is a name of God. It mostly indicates something very special about the person to whom it's been given, the destiny of that person. We see this in Abraham, how Abraham became Abraham, the father of many nations. And out of the many titles given to Jesus, each one of them tells us something special about him, something really, really important about Jesus. And I believe that this will really bless us through this Christmas season as we have chosen the ones that specifically relate to that. So the first title we want to have a look at today is from a Christmas verse, which is Isaiah 9 and verse 6. I think you're all very familiar with this. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. 
Notice how accurate this prophecy is. You know, God is so intentional about every word that he says because we see two expressions here. Firstly, a child is born, but a son is given. See, Jesus did not come into existence at the time of his human birth. He is eternal. He is the eternal Son of God. He was not born the Son of God, but he was given as the Son of God. But in human history, he was born as a child. You see how accurate that that is. Now, in this wonderful prophecy that we see right here, that's so real for us during this time. During this Christmas season, we find four titles here. We see Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. Isn't it just remarkable that this little child in Scripture is called Mighty God? I mean, who could that be but Jesus? But the title I really want us to to focus on right now from this verse is Wonderful Counselor. And I'd like to just compare this to another prophecy, which is also found in the book of Isaiah. And this is really speaking about the coming Messiah. Let's have a look at this. Isaiah chapter 11, it says, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Now, this is a prediction, actually, of the Messiah. And what we see here is that the Spirit of God will rest on him in all of his fullness. But that's for another time. Right now, what I want you to see in this this verse for now is this, is that those aspects that we particularly see here are the ones that emphasize him to be the wonderful counselor. The words that I really want you to look at here is wisdom, understanding, counsel, and knowledge. You see, someone said, it doesn't matter what the question is. Jesus is always the answer. Amen? He is the one who will show you what to do. Family, when no one else can show you. He is the one, when you've come to the end of your own wits, when you've come to the end of your own resources, remember, there is a wonderful counselor. And let's just talk about this word wonderful. I mean, in the scriptures, it's, it's, it's notes at various times and places. It always suggests something supernatural, something marvelous. So in this picture that we see of Jesus here as the wonderful counselor, we see certain elements. Number one, it is on a supernatural level. It's way past mere psychology and human counseling however helpful that can be. Secondly, what we see, it includes discernment. You see, Jesus always sees right into the heart of every person, of every problem. And thirdly, it includes direction. He has the answer. Not only does he discern the problem accurately, family, but he always gives the right solution. Let us consider just two pictures of Jesus, really, as the wonderful counselor that we see that's found in the Gospels. The first describes his calling of his first two disciples, and we see this in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 18. Now watch this. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Okay, go back one. I missed something there, sorry. So here's the thing that's important about that. Out of all the potential disciples that were there, isn't it amazing that Jesus chose these two men who were just plain ordinary fishermen. I mean, they had no great education. They had no relation really to to the teachers of the law and the priests, just plain ordinary fishermen. But Jesus, the wonderful counselor, saw something in those men that he knew what he could make of them. So he says, now if you will commit yourself to me, if you follow me, I will make you fishers of men. Now, here's what we need to understand, that the important thing in our relationship with Jesus, it's not where we're at, who we are, what we're doing when we start, but what he is going to make 
of us. And this morning, you may feel like Gideon. We spoke about that before. The weakest of the weakest of the weak, amen? But his wonderful counsel family will see in each one who comes to him what we can be if we would just yield to him, amen? So the second picture I want to show you as the wonderful counselor is this, and it's about the rich young ruler, and it's found in Mark, and it's Mark chapter 10 from verse 17, and we read this now, as he was going along the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he answered and said to him, teacher, these things I have kept from my youth. But Jesus, oh family, this verse is so loaded. Just watch this. Jesus looking at him, loved him, and he said to him, one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, give it to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, take up your cross and follow me. Carries on and says, But he was sad at the word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. You see how Jesus looked right into the hearts of that young man. And he loved him, and he wanted the best for him, but he had to tell him the truth. The man said, I've kept all the commandments. It's interesting that thou shalt not covet is not mentioned here. Have no other gods before me is not mentioned here. See, Jesus saw there was just one barrier between what God had for this young man, and that was his possessions. He was bound by materialism. Jesus looked right down to his heart and he said, just one thing you have to do, sell all you have and follow me. Now let's understand, Jesus did not say that to everyone because he knew the particular hindrance in every person's life. But to this young man, he said, money and possessions are your hindrances. You want what I have to to give, you got to let them go. You see, God doesn't mind that we have riches He minds that riches have us, that we are bound by the mammon system, as it were. And we can learn from this. I mean, so many people don't want to surrender their lives completely to God because they say they're just things in their lives that they don't want to give up. I mean, that's like saying, I don't want to give up my little one-bedroom apartment, and God's got a mansion for you. How many of you have found that our our priorities in Christ outweigh anything that we may have left behind? And I'm saying that intentionally, because family, the closer we get to Jesus, the more we get to know Jesus, the more the things of the world simply fall off of us. Amen? And more than that, if, if we have a problem or we have a need, remember there is a wonderful counselor who doesn't focus on the little that we may feel that we have to offer, but he sees in us potential that he is well able to develop. He looks deep into our hearts and our soul and he can fill every void inside of us. He is wonderful. That is, he's supernatural. He is the counselor. He discerns correctly and he gives the correct solutions. Amen? And you know what? His office is open 24-7. We never need to be afraid to go to him. And sometimes when we feel like we're in a bad place, instead of running to our wonderful counselor, we run away from him. But maybe I, I should just say this again, a word of warning that many people in our contemporary Western culture, even Christians, Christmas has has become associated with that materialism and commercialism and and self-indulgence. And there's a very stern scripture that has a very clear warning for us about this in Galatians 6 and and verse 8. And it says this, For the one who sows to his own flesh shall from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit shall from the Spirit reap corruption eternal life. 
And sadly, so much of our Christmas celebration has become sowing to the flesh. And, and I'm not saying don't have the tinsel and the lights and the gifts and all of those things. Those things in themselves are not wrong. But family, they, they just have no permanent value. The thing is this, we need to be conscious of and not to forget the reason for the season. Jesus is the bright and morning star. And we need to allow his light to shine through us to touch the lives of others. So let's make a resolution this Christmas that we are not going to sow to the flesh. We're going to sow to the Spirit, keep our hearts and minds focused on Jesus and keep him the center of all of our Christmas celebrations. Amen? Let's go back to our scripture in Isaiah 9 and verse 6. And really what I want us to see right now are these things I've said. The government shall be upon his shoulders and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. This is what I want you to consider right now, that title, Prince of Peace. You see, this word prince in the scriptures always designates a ruler. It's not just that, that family inheritance or a title like Prince Charles, but it actually represents somebody who is an active ruler, responsible for government. And we see there's a sudden emphasis here in this prophecy. It says, a child is born, a son is given, and the government will rest upon his shoulders. Watch that. Amen? This is the first feature of the son in this prophecy. We see the last of those four titles there particularly emphasizes his character as a ruler. He is the prince or the ruler of peace. Now, there are two things in our experience and in human history that can never be separated from each other. The first one is righteous government, and the second one is peace. And this is true of us as individuals and even as nations and even whole civilizations. Family only insofar as there is righteous government can there be peace. And sadly, we, we have a very limited and an incomplete picture of peace in terms of its biblical meaning. You see, in our current society, especially relating to government, we don't really see what God is telling us here. Peace is just something that we need to think about. We, we talk about peace as, as long as there isn't open warfare, as long as nations aren't actually fighting one another with military weapons, then we say there's peace. But peace is not just the absence of war. Think about it. I mean, how can we say that there's peace when there's bitterness and hatred and, and accusation and racism and the systematic attempt to undermine other people and nations, and to outdo them, and to bring them down. I mean, that's not peace. You know that the, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom, and it means a whole lot more than that. The root meaning is completeness and order. So we're talking about order and completeness. Now, the good news of the, is that God is going to establish his righteous government in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's look at this proclamation of the gospel as we see in various passages in the book of Matthew. The first one is in Matthew 3, verse 1. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He was the first one to proclaim this message. He said, God's kingdom, God's government is coming. Now, Jesus, when he started preaching, he said this, he said in, in, in Matthew 4 verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, the government. In Matthew 4 and verse 23, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and disease among the people. Interesting that the kingdom and the healing seem to go hand in hand. But notice that the good news is the kingdom, that, the, that God is going to bring his government to earth and we're all going to be able to enjoy the benefit of that government. Now again in Matthew 24 and verse 14, we read this, and this gospel or this good news of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations and then the end will come. 
When we, the church, the body of Christ, have done that, then Jesus will return and the new heaven and the new earth, as we read in 2 Peter 3 and verse 13 and various other places in the Bible. Now, family, we really, we, we kind of misunderstood. You see, when Jesus was teaching this message, there was this misunderstanding that he was going to overthrow the Roman Empire and become king. But we see here that all nations have a right to hear at least once the gospel is going to be preached, that God is going to set up his kingdom in the person of the king, the prince of peace, Jesus. And that is the only hope that for peace in humanity. In Isaiah 57 and verse 9, 19, we have God's promise for peace. But we also have here a warning that, that peace is, is not for everybody. It's not for the wicked. Peace are not for those who refuse God's righteous government in the person of Jesus. We cannot have peace apart from the Prince of Peace. And this, this is what Isaiah says. It says, peace Peace to him who is afar off and to him that is near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. But the wicked are like a troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. You see this family, those who refuse God's offer are like a sea that just cannot rest. I mean, it's, it's always tossing. It's never fully quiet. It's never totally calm. There's always these elements of unrest and dit- disturbance there. And that comes through the rejection of God's righteous government in the person of Jesus. So Jesus is the Prince of Peace, the ruler whose government alone can bring peace to humanity. Jesus is the only solution. Humanity has also been confronted by this fact that man in his own unregenerate, unregenerate, rebellious nature cannot offer true peace. I mean, they can't give us that really, truly good government. And so God's answer is Jesus, the Prince of Peace. But thank God we don't have to wait till the future to experience this peace because Jesus Jesus has told us, he said in John 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You see, when we willingly yield to the lordship of Jesus in our lives, we can experience that peace right now. The same as in the Old Testament, the people received healing before Jesus even died on the cross. But watch this, family. When we have peace on the inside, we have good governance in the way we live. We proclaim his gospel, the kingdom, by our lifestyle, order and completeness. Even when there's confusion and chaos in the world, we can walk in peace because Jesus is the Prince of Peace and we give him rulership over our lives so we can walk in that peace and we live in this peaceful kingdom, as it were, because we are under the rulership of the Prince of Peace. You see that? So to have peace in my life are not just those times that there's this absence of conflict, but there's this inner sense of knowing that I belong to God, that I may make mistakes, but Jesus governs my life. He leads me and he guides me and he forgives me. In Psalm 23, it says, your rod and staff, they comfort me. In Psalm 91, he says, He will cover me with his feathers and under his wings I will take refuge. I belong to Jesus. And with that, he heals all my inner conflict, all my fears, all my anxiety, and his favor surrounds me like a shield. And that's what we want. And that family is just the first step because to walk in God's fullness, we need to learn about him as the word of God. How is it that Jesus can be the word of God in our lives? And unfortunately, for so many people, today, they leave Christ right out of Christmas, and so they miss its real and permanent significance. Have you ever noticed how many people don't even write Christmas out in full anymore? They write Xmas, and really, that's very revealing, because conventionally, the letter X is used to, 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 to communicate an unknown quantity. So when we write Xmas instead of Christmas, we actually acknowledging that Christ is an unknown quantity in our lives. So, so these two titles that we've looked at so far, both taken from Isaiah 9 and verse 6, Wonderful Counselor, 
Prince of Peace. But now what we're going to do, we're going to be looking more in the writings of John because we want to see Jesus as he, it is the Word of God. Now let's just have a look, first of all, at the opening verse of John's very first gospel, John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Notice how in this verse, this phrase, the Word, comes up three times, and the one so designated is Jesus. Amen? In His eternal nature. So not Jesus, the son of Mary, but Jesus, the Son of God, the one who was eternally before creation with God and who himself was God, the second person of the Godhead. And then in verse 14, we see, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. And again, we see the title of Jesus. He is the only Son, the eternal begotten Son. Not created, but begotten, eternal, of one nature and being with the Father himself. As such, the Word became flesh. And family, that is the embodiment of what we celebrate at Christmas time. He lived for a while among us, but he is the eternal word that came into human history in the person of a little baby who was born and wrapped and placed in a manger in Bethlehem and grew up as a boy, as a carpenter's son. Now Jesus not only came as a baby, but family, the scriptures make it very, very clear that he's going to come again in power and glory to judge and to reign. And again, there's this very vivid picture of his future coming that is in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 11. And once again, in this context, he is called the Word of God. And John says this, I saw the heaven open and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on it is called Faithful and True. Another two names of Jesus there. And in righteousness, he judges and wages war. Watch this, his eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And so there we see him again in his glorious majesty, coming to judge and to rule and to and in his Oh, family, he's just so awesome. And wearing these many, many crowns, kingly crowns, and dressed in this robe, dressed, dipped in blood. And they're speaking of his sacrifice of himself on the cross. And we see his name is called the Word of God. Now, that Greek word is, that is translated, therefore, word is logos. But we need to understand a little bit more about this word logos. You see, logos is not just the spoken word. It's not just the written word. But embedded in there is the following. It means whole understanding. That's what Jesus is. He is not only the spoken word, not only the written word. Family, he is the total mind and counsel of God. Look at this. Everything God knows, everything God wants to say, everything God wants to do is all wrapped up in Jesus, the Word of God. So to understand that Jesus is the Word of God, we know that, that God reveals Himself in various ways in creation and in history. <laughs> but when God wants to really say what is on His heart, He's only got one way to say it. He says it in Jesus. You see, Jesus is the ultimate revelation of God. Only He totally knows God. Let us look at a description of, of Jesus in His eternal nature in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 1, it says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. Now there's significance in this word last. Jesus is the last Word of God. The prophets came and they had much to say, but when God wanted to say it all, He summed it all up. He sent His Son, and this is how the Son is described. Whom He appointed heir of all things, 
and through whom He also made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. After He provided purification for our sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Too far too quiet. Is it only me that's so excited? <clears throat> Excuse me. Now I want you to see seven statements about the Son. Have a look at this family. Number one, He is heir of all things. Number two, everything is going to come into fulfillment through Him. Number three, He made the universe. It says, he, it, it is, it's just He created everything with God. Number four, he himself being uncreated is the radiance of God's glory and the way that God's glory comes into our lives. Number five, he is the exact representation of his being and the way that we get to know God exactly as he is. Remember Jesus said at one point, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Number six, he sustains all things by his powerful word. And number seven, he is the one who upholds all all of creation. And then there are two facts about our redemption. Number one, He provided purification for sins by His death on the cross. And then having done so, number two, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven at a place of all authority, all power and all glory. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus is the Word of God, the full, complete revelation and unfolding of all God has and all God wants to say. And let me emphasize this. Without revelation, man cannot know God. Family, Jesus, we, we are dependent on God's own sovereign revelation of Himself if we are to know what God is like. But watch this. It pleased the Father to give us His total revelation of Himself in the person of His Son, the Word made flesh and the one in whom God has said all He has to say. So Jesus is that revelation of God and He is the Word of God and He is the one who shows us what God is really like and He is the one who opens up the very heart and nature and being of God and He is the one that shows us. He's the one who gives us the, the picture of God of who He really, really is and He reveals to us the mercy of God and He reveals to us the faithfulness of God and the wisdom of God. He's the one who really gives us shows us what God is really like. And when God speaks to, about His Word, family, we're not talking about words like we read in a, in a novel. We're speaking about life. Amen. He was speaking about filled with the Spirit. We're speaking about someone filled with power. And that's who Jesus is. Look at this in John 6 and verse 63. It says, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh provides no benefit. The words that I have spoken to you are Spirit and they are life. And I'm going to be ending with this right now. I want to say this again. Jesus is God's last word. He is the full and final revelation. Listen to me, family. If we reject that revelation, we cannot expect to hear from God in some other way. There is no other way. Jesus said, I am the way. No one comes to the Father but by me. You cannot reject Jesus and come to the Father. We need to receive Him. We need to believe in Him. Open up our hearts and mind to Him. I'm going to give us an opportunity in a moment. And He will show us the true and real nature of God. You won't be groping anymore. You won't be wondering. You will have a clear understanding of who God is. And also an ever-increasing knowledge, a brighter revelation of the true nature and person of God the Father. I'd like right now every head to be bowed and every eye to be closed. I want to hand over to the venue pastors, the hosts that are there now. Pastors, if you will just take it over from this time. You see, we need to understand if you guys that are online, don't go away. Stay with me. I really want to share this with you. See, God is an answer to all of our problems. This is not just 
a way of salvation to, to, to go to heaven and stay out of hell. We're talking here, there's just so, so much more to the salvation. There's deliverance and there's healing and there's peace. And there's just two conditions. The one is the Bible tells us that we need to confess with our hearts. We need to, first of all, sorry, believe in our hearts the record of the gospel, that God raised Jesus from the dead. And then we have to confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. And this, this is your opportunity right now. If you want to come and say, I don't really know the wonderful counselor, as you've been saying. And I've maybe never surrendered my life completely to the rulership of the Prince of Peace. Maybe you've, you've, taken, you've said the salvation prayer before, but you say, I'm not really walking in that peace. I want to give myself completely to know that the Word of God is ruling in my life. So I'm going to just I'm going to say, ask you just to stay where you are. I'm going to count to three in a moment and just ask if you would just, just raise your hand. That's all I'm asking you to just raise your hand. So if you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, if you want to be sure that you're going to heaven, if you really want to surrender your life completely to God this morning, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand right now. One, two, three. And if you're online, I want you to do that right where you are because God can see who you are. I see that hand. Thank you so much. I see that hand. Thank you so, so much. This is the best decision you've ever made. What a beautiful time to do this just before Christmas. Praise you, Lord Jesus. Come on, you know it's you. You feel like your heart is pounding out of your tre- chest right now. Just raise your hand exactly the way you are. I'm going to ask you now just simply to repeat this prayer after me. Say this, I'm not, Lord Jesus, I'm accepting. Come on, family, let's all say together. Let's start again. Lord Jesus, I'm accepting your government in my life. I've made a mess of it. I'm not capable of fully governing my own life. I don't really have that peace that you've promised. I make this decision to make you Lord of my life without reservation. Come into my life right now. Take full control. Govern my life and give me peace. I declare, Lord Jesus, you are my Lord and my Saviour. I am born again. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Now, if that's you, raise your hand. I'm going to ask you just to go with the person that's standing on the aisle. They're going to take you to a place of prayer, and they'll be able to share some things with you, give you some literature to show you your next steps. And if you're online and and you've done this right now, congratulations. Would you just text SAVED? to 4991 so that we can assist you in your next steps as well. Family, come on, let's give God praise. Just give Him praise. Hallelujah. We serve an awesome, awesome God. Amen. Thank you for watching the Christian Family Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join our online community and join us live every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream and share this with your friends. Thank you again for watching and God bless you.